have started looking at carefully in the dog is like normal dog behaviors and how they might be altered by pain. So all of you, when you see your dog get up, and you'll, when you see these videos, you'll say, oh, I've seen that. So what do most dogs do when they get up? They get up, they usually stretch. It seems for some reason, most often they stretch twice, and then they shake themselves. And a lot of dogs, that's a very normal routine. Now, you know that, but then if you start looking at surgical dogs or dogs post-surgical, you can often see that dog shake be very, very um, altered. So what you'll see in animals that are painful is that the, the shake is what I call pulled when it reaches the painful part of the body. So I'm going to show some video, a, a video of a Springer Spaniel. And what you'll see is that he'll shake ahead of and caudal to his painful um, incision. He's had a thoracotomy, midline thoracotomy, and an abdominal surgery. So one of the things that we look for is to intervene and then look at the return of a normal dog behavior, a very basic dog behavior, the shake. So what I'm going to show you is, and watch carefully, so this dog, when we show the first video, has a shake that is pulled ahead of and only in, is initiated caudal to his painful body part. So here he is. Do you see that? He shakes, he shakes in front of his incision, and he shakes just a little bit behind his incision. But he doesn't do what you all recognize as the real dog shake. So obviously, and for all other things, palpating his wound, there's lots of other things. So he, there was major intervention to improve his um, pain level. And now look at him afterwards. And then you see and recognize this normal dog behavior. So he's much, much better. But wait till you see him do his real shake. Yeah, so is anyone, does that suddenly put on a light bulb? Like, oh, I've seen that. But that dogs will do that. They'll, they won't shake at the painful incision. So look for things like the real dog shake, good sign. The dog stretch. Now, we said when dogs get up, they usually stretch. This is a dog stretch. This is not a good dog stretch. This is a dog that is actually quite painful. As you can see, she's had a spay, here, a spay incision here. And that actually, she's just waking up from anesthesia. But if we went then and palpated her wound, we would probably find that she was tense and so on. So that stretch is not a waking up stretch. Um, she's coming around from anesthesia, and that's actually a painful dog stretch. Orientation in the cage is important. But obviously, though, certainly with cats and with dogs, depending on their personality, there are some of them that always want to be up front, and some of them that are scared and shy and want to be at the back. So on a single observation, orientation in the cage is probably not very useful, but it is probably very useful for a specific animal. So here's a cat comparing it before and after surgery. So before surgery, he's up front and actually can unlatch the gate. And here he is after, had major orthopedic surgery, but where is he? He's up front trying to get out. Good sign he's at the front of the cage, the way he was earlier, interested in what's going on. Now, Comparing over time, here's a cat that was in our ICU unit a, um, a few weeks ago. Was doing well up at the front, and then as his pain management lapsed and he wasn't doing so well, he went to the back of the cage and was trying to hide. So that gave me an indicator that something wasn't right with, with him. And again, with dogs, up at the front, interested in what's going on, or you know, at the back here, you know, just please don't bother me and please go away, not interested. Probably good things to even just briefly, you know, inventory, like where is that dog sitting and what's his interest in what's going on. We're going to look at posture in, in cats and then in dogs as well. And so again, once you know what normal postures are, you can start to pick up the abnormal postures. So on the left here, we have one of my cats in a normal 18-hour-a-day uh, posture. Um, <laughs> so you know, very relaxed, curled up, you know, very comfortable. Here's another um, cat sitting in the clinic. Um, actually, you know, if you were there, you could tell that he was really quite relaxed. His head is up, his eyes are looking at you. You know, he, you might all go, he looks a little nervous, and I would agree. But these are fairly normal postures. And then we'll talk about, like, he's got his little front legs turned in there um, in the pretzel pose, as I call it. Um, so these are fairly normal postures. So then you start looking for abnormal postures 
or normal postures in a hospitalized cat. So here we have the normal, healthy, um, you know, non-painful cat. Now here's a cat in a very similar position. And this to me is a good sign. I go to check the cat and the first thing I see is a nice, relaxed posture. This cat actually has a, a feeding tube in, a fractured jaw, he's got in IV lines, but he's adopted a normal posture, good sign. Now here's, again, comparing normal and abnormal. So this cat, this is not a normal posture. Um, and you'll start to pick up that there's something about his face as well that makes us wonder how comfortable he is. This is a post-amputation cat. He's fairly flat out, and if you were there in reality, he's actually quite tense, and then he has this facial expression. So abnormal posture, we need to look at that cat quite closely. Um, so tucked up and crouched after abdominal surgery is something that is documented and if you videotape cats before and after surgery, um, them getting hunched and tucked up is a behavior that emerges after surgery, which is rarely exhibited prior to surgery. And certainly Dr. Warren, she published on that. We've got some preliminary data from the group at Glasgow. So this hunched up or this hunched posture is classic for abdominal pain in cats. Um, you'll also see the head is down and there is this facial expression, um, the eyes, and we'll talk about what that might mean. But a lot of you are going to say, well, sure. But that's what fearful and scared cats do. They go to the back of the cage and they crouch. Well, I would agree that that is true. But when you start looking really carefully and looking at before and after, I would say that, yes, fearful and scared cats go and crouch at the back of the cage. But look at this specific cat um, before and after. So yeah, there she is, scared and hunched up, but look at her after surgery. Look at the difference in her face and her eyes, and then look at that body posture. So when you start looking at the difference before and after, that's when it really um, you know, looks very obvious. And this is why usually you have your technicians are the ones that are key to telling you what's going on with animals in your clinic or at the hospital, because they see them before and they see them after, and we're often in the surgery room and we're missing this type of thing. So posture in dogs, again, the, the head up, alert, looking out, versus the flat out, you know, obviously exhausted, I'm painful um, posture. So certainly you get used to looking at these um, normal postures. And again, these are two classic bad postures that we wouldn't want to see in a dog. Head down, kind of like trying to relieve the pain in the abdomen. And again, here's a dog, head down, and trying, obviously, somehow to relieve its abdominal pain. Here's a dog six hours post ovarian hysterectomy. And as soon as we go to the cage, we know something's wrong. I, I think there's something wrong. She didn't want to get up, but she was at the front of the cage. We got her up, we get her out, and we see that posture. The praying posture is something that's well described in the literature. We don't see it very often now that we have good pain management protocols in place, but you will see it every now and again. And this is a, a classic sign of severe abdominal pain in a dog. You'll see it after spays, splenectomies, any kind of abdominal procedure. And she's actually, when they were um, assessing her pain, very, very tense and flinching to palpation of the wound. So obviously, you know, you don't need a, pay, a complicated pain scale to say you need to intervene and do something. And then we did, and here she is following intervention. So she's already up because she heard us coming. She's at the front of the cage. Um, we get her out, we're palpating the wound, and she's relaxed, completely different dog, and we watched her for a while and she didn't adopt that prey posture. So we should not be seeing that prey posture. Do not confuse it with the dog stretch when they first get up. Um, it's a very different behavior when you look at it carefully. It's not a normal dog stretch. It's, they look like they're praying. What about vocalization and what does it mean? And certainly in the Glasgow Composite Pain Scale, vocalization is one of the um, behaviors that is in their, one of their six categories they look at. With cats, I think it's maybe not as clear cut what vocalization may really mean. But listen to this one. So probably everyone agrees, not a happy sounding cat. Yep. Um, so he's had major orthopedic surgery, but there's some other things. That's that little cat that you saw who usually was at the front of the cage, 
um, wanting to get out. Where is he now? He's at the back of the cage. Did anyone notice what he was doing with his lips? Licking. You see that quite a lot in, in cats that are painful. Now, they'll do it when they're nervous as well, but you'll see it a lot in pain cats. And then the other thing he was doing was extending and uh, extending his back legs, and that, again, is a, is a pain behavior in cats. And that's been documented by the group in Brazil. So he has a lot of things going on that make me think he is not happy. But what we were focusing on there was his vocalization. So we intervened, and then he sounds a little bit different later. And again, all these things we're building on, look at the next video. Where is he in the cage? What's his interaction with me compared to um, his interaction in this one? Yeah. So it sounds very different. He was at the front of the cage. And so he sounded like, a, it sounded like, oh, don't put me in the cage again. So a much different, a very different before and after picture there. What about this? Okay, so something that we see just as animals are waking up, and it can be quite difficult. Is that pain, or is it what we call emergence delirium? They're waking up suddenly after surgery, and that can be a very difficult thing to figure out whether they're painful or delirious or emerging from anesthesia. We're going to look at another video, another video, which is like, is this dog dysphoric or is he painful when you're just looking at him? So sometimes when you look at them, it can be, are they, is it emergence delirium? Is it dysphoria? What is it? So obviously you have to go in and figure out, is it pain or is it dysphoria? What, what you suddenly see, you see quite a lot of dysphoria sometimes when animals have had too many opioids. Um, we've been very proactive in like giving more and more analgesics to animals, and sometimes you'll see a dysphoric animal. Now, if he had been a husky and behaving like that, would everyone have just dismissed it? Most people would have said, it's because it's just a husky, right? So you've got to be very, very careful that you're not being um, you know, breed you know, sensitive and so on. So this dog, we then went in, you know, palpated his wound, reassessed him, and so on. Now what I find is if an animal is painful, usually when you palpate the wound, you're going to get a reaction. The other thing is usually you can distract a painful animal for a short period of time. You can get its attention and get it to calm down just for a second. If they're dysphoric, they are out to lunch and they are not going to calm down. <laughs> they will, you can try and hold them, you can try and calm them down, and you can't. So sometimes that's a good way to differentiate pain and dysphoria. So then it's the question is, what are you going to do? And sometimes you're not sure. Sometimes, to me, it's very clear that the dog has had way too many opioids and is dysphoric. And so what I will sometimes do is get a very, very dilute um, solution of naloxone and start very, 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 very slowly titrating a little bit of naloxone into them. And then suddenly, you'll get a dog that's behaving normally. If you've used an opioid agonist like morphine or um, hydromorphone, you could give some butorphanol and see if that brings them back to normal. But sometimes you're like, oh, but what if I'm wrong? I'm going to make them more painful. So what we did with this dog, I was pretty sure He'd had too many opioids, but not everybody agreed with me. So I went with the consensus opinion was that maybe he was still painful, but we could maybe sedate him um, and not reverse him. So what we, did we do? We gave him dexmedetomidine. Good analgesic, good sedative if you're just not sure. And now we have, obviously, someone checking the heart rate to make sure it's okay. But we have a relaxed, calm Labrador who, you know, obviously has now more pain medication on board and then we can, um, what I decided was not to give him any more opioids, let him wake up and reassess him later. But I, you know, the pain, dysphoria, and emergence delirium can be difficult to differentiate. Wound tenderness, I think, is um, something that is very important to, to look at if you can. And certainly we've done studies and studies have been published where we've used um, specific pulpometers that measure how much pain we can, or how much pressure we can apply to a wound 
in, before the animal responds and look at different anesthetic protocols and so on. So I do try and do this as much as possible with dogs and with cats. So let's go through just a couple of um, wound assessment um, things. You can see the hands creeping in. And you can hear, it's Dr. McCune in the background saying, I'm not touching her anymore. I think we already know. And she's right. So, but did you see where the, where's the cat in the cage? And we knew this cat. This was a cat that belonged to someone that works at UF. So we knew it was usually a friendly cat. What about this facial expression? We're going to go into that in more detail. And did you see her licking her lips as well? And barely palpating this cat. This was a mastectomy case. Barely palpating her and obviously very obvious response. And she, we intervened and made her much better. What about this one? You've seen this cat before. He's the friendly, wants to get out cat. Yeah, so he had had a bone graft taken out of his shoulder. Um, the resident's pressing pretty darn hard, and he's like, well, you can obviously tell he's on opioids, right? Um, <laughs> but, you know, no response to palpation, so excellent. And then there's the in-between. Now, I'm guessing everybody in this audience is going to get this one, but a lot of people who are not good with cats won't get this one. So this is Bob, who has a similar injury. Um, he's got um, wound, he's had his graft taken there. So I'm guessing everyone here knows that was a normal cat greeting behavior to me. That was not a response to palpation. But a lot of people that are not, that don't speak cat, would say, ooh, I poked and he lifted his head up and did that. He responded to palpation. So again, the better trained your staff are at normal interactions with animals and knowing what that is, um, the better. Because that was like, of course, he, and then we went back and we palpated his other wounds and he didn't respond and it was good. So understanding normal behavior, very important. Now, not always possible. So that cat, I'm like, OK, I am not going to be palpating your wound. And obviously, when we work with feral cats, that is going to be the biggest issue. So it's not always possible. But certainly, if they're showing all these other behaviors, you're going to intervene and hopefully have a much um, happier uh, animal. Here's a, a dog post-spay. So you could tell I wasn't expecting that <laughs> when I went up to her. Um, so I would, had barely even started palpator, so she's very um, hyperesthetic and, and very painful there. And then after she sat up, I mean, she didn't bite me. She didn't, you know, she's waking. But did you also see what she was doing? Lick lipping. That is um, another well-defined, documented pain behavior after um, ovarian hysterectomy in, in dogs. So the licking the lips is, is another component of that video. So obviously, intervention's required, and we go back, and I'm being a little more careful this time. And then I see she's much more relaxed, not as tense. So there's some response, and she's going to, as I apply a little bit more pressure, there's a little bit of response. So she's not perfect, but she's certainly much, much um, improved from the first um, video. 